as we all woke up Saturday to the horrific scenes of innocent civilians being murdered and slaughtered by a terrorist attack from Hamas. I watched with horror of what was transpiring. As many of you know, ever since I've been in Congress, I would lead a delegation to Israel every term. When I took over, I made sure it was bipartisan and joined with then-leader Steny Hoyer. To get a clear understanding, as Speaker, my very first trip internationally was to Israel. I spoke at the Knesset in honor of the 75th anniversary of the creation of their country. At this moment in time, I think about what I said inside their chambers. I said, our values are your values. Our heritage is your heritage. Our dreams are your dreams. America is grateful for our friendship with Israel. We are a better nation because of it. And we must never shy away from defending it. Now is the time for action. America needs a five-point plan to meet this moment, to help our ally Israel, and to strengthen our own future. The very first thing we need to do is rescue the American hostages. President Biden's number one priority right now must be finding out how many Americans have been taken hostage and get them home. From last night to this, this morning, the number of American deaths have doubled from four to nine. This administration must also make clear that harming any American will result in the wrath of the United States. We cannot repeat what happened in Afghanistan. It must be clear that we do not negotiate with terrorists and no American will be left behind. Biden's policy on appeasement, including money for hostage deals, must come to an end. His policy has over only emboldened terrorists. And handing over $6 billion to Iran only helps the cause. In explaining that to members of Congress, they said they had provisions to refreeze the money if Iran has done something wrong. They should freeze the money back today. Secondly, the leader of Hamas is reported to be sitting in a five-star hotel cheering, watching women, children, grandparents being slaughtered and murdered in the streets. President Biden should demand his extradition now. Second, we must be there for our friend Israel. And what that means, it means action now. You see, I've been down to Gaza many times. I've sat next to the Iron Dome in a bipartisan group of members from both sides of the aisle. When we talked to those soldiers and asked them what they feared, is to be overwhelmed. See, a battery if an Iron Dome would go up and knock out a missile. It would first calculate where that missile was going and go next to it and knock it out. But it only has about 20 missiles at a time. We're watching 5,000 go. We always knew their, their plan was to build enough missiles to overwhelm. And that first set of missiles to be dumb missiles until you took out all the ability in the Iron Dome to knock them down. Then you send the precision-guided, long-range missiles to go to larger populations. We need to resupply Israel where they have no doubt that they will ever be overwhelmed. Third, we must confront Iran. Hamas is Iran's proxy. They brag that they were helped by Iran to attack Israel. We must counter this new axis of power. It's an evil axis of Iran, Russia, and China. By building stronger coalitions across the Middle East, 
we must also expand the Abraham Accords to promote peace and freedom. Three years ago, there was not war in Europe or in Israel, but today there is. The United States must reinstate the maximum pressure campaign against Iran. Refreezing the $6 billion is only the start. But under the last administration, Iran was only producing 400,000 barrels of oil a day. Now it's $3 million. They're making billions of dollars. If you look at the foreign currency reserves, three years ago, Iran had $4 billion. Today, it's $70 billion. They are wealthier, richer, and stronger under this Biden administration, and they're using that wealth to fund terrorism, attacking our allies, and killing Americans. And it must stop today. Sanctions should go on Iran's production of oil, and we should replace it with American energy, unshackle the blessings that, Amer that God has given America. Let us be energy independent to supply our allies. It will also be better for the environment. If we simply replaced Russian natural gas in Europe for one year, we would lower CO2 emissions by 200 million tons in one year. We must enforce harsher sanctions, cut off Iran's ability to export oil, and to refuse to enter any future nuclear deals. In ramping up American production to ensure the safety and security of us here at home and our allies abroad. In the long term, we need to rebalance the power dynamics in the region, which means making America the energy powerhouse of the world. Fourth, we must focus on our own security. This just wasn't a failure in Israel on their intelligence community. It was ours as well. Why did we not know this was taking? Why do we have a Secretary of State who says he has no knowledge if Iran wasn't involved? He has less knowledge than the Wall Street Journal of meetings in Beirut and others, of the sophisticated plans going on for months. In an own Twitter notice, of more than 40 days ago, of Hamas telling us, preparing for war. In looking at our own intelligent failures, we have to look to our border. In 2019, there was zero arrest of people on the FBI terrorist watch list trying to come across our border. Just in this year alone, there's 151 from 160 different countries. In my own state, we caught two coming from Yemen on the terrorist watch list, from China and others. Why are they coming to America? What do they have planned? And who are they communicating with? President Biden has said previously that he believes the number one threat to America is facing is climate change. That is not true. The number one threat killing Americans is terrorism. The number one threat is an open border. The number one threat is weakening our economic power by lowering our ability to produce our own energy. Our number one threat is appeasement and funding Iran. Our number one threat is letting the buildup of the axis of the evil power of Iran, Russia, and China. Rather focus on his Green New Deal, he should focus on protecting the American people. We need an immediate assessment of our own areas of weakness and a glaring weakness in our own southern border. We know that individuals on the terrorist watch list have crossed Biden's open border. Who are these people? Who are they in contact with? And what are their plans to here in America? Fifth, as we look inward, we must confront anti-Semitism in the United States. To every single president of a college and university, do not sit back. Do not let anti-Semitism grow. Confront it and deny it. Condemn it. And the anti-Semitism here in this house 
Saying no comment is not leadership. Allowing elected members of this body to speak anti-Semitism and not condone it, condemn it is wrong. To avoid it is wrong. As speaker, I watched a member on the other side of the aisle try to res reserve a building in here to celebrate anti-Semitism. I removed it. I removed a member from foreign affairs based upon anti-Semitism. I watched others yesterday continue those remarks. I watched the leadership on the other side say no comment. Have we not learned anything from history? Have we not understand the moment in life we are living? Do we not realize that weakening America strengthens our enemies? Allowing Iran to produce more oil, appeasement, paying ransoms for American hostages has only made us weaker on the world stage. These five actions must be taken now. And to the president, turn off the barbecue and speak to the American people. Be the leader the world is looking for. Otherwise, the world will stay unsafe. With that, I'll take some questions. Yes. Given this crisis of procedure, there's been a lot of focus on the paralysis here in the House. Over the weekend, several of your members, even called for you to be reinstated as Speaker. Do you envision any scenario in which you could be a candidate for Speaker, especially with the deadlock in this race? Look, um, this is about a moment in time. This is about what America's going to do. Could you imagine if we were sitting here and we listened further to a Gates and Mace that we were in a shutdown? That we, as we asked our 30,000 men and women in the military in the Middle East to defend us without being paid? That the question around the world of what was happening here today? That's a decision by the conference. I'll allow the conference to make whatever decision. Whether I'm speaker or not, I'm a member of this body. I know what history has had, and I can lead in any position it is. And right now, I realize we need these five actions taken now and stop delaying. Yes? Um, what action can or should the House take this week? Obviously, there is a question of whether it can pass a resolution or whether it's appropriate. Look, unfortunately, the House can do nothing without a speaker. I could be upset with eight, but I could be upset with every single Democrat as well. They both made the same decision, a political decision, instead of putting America first. And so you have to finish the speaker, or I know this is new territory. It was created after 9-11. I don't understand why the speaker pro tem couldn't lead as well. We should have a resolution on the floor condemning what's taken place so the rest of the world understands. We should supply and make sure that there's no question and no doubt that Israel will never be overwhelmed when it comes to ammunition. That if they decide to send the precision-guided missiles, that they will be knocked down. We should send no doubt to anyone that holds an American citizen that we will not leave without them. This will not be Afghanistan. We will not allow this administration to do this again. Yes. Look, I'm going to allow the conference to do their work, but the one thing I would ask my conference, you have 96% of the conference in one place, and you're allowing 4% with the Democrats playing politics, but now are putting a doubt inside this body. That is wrong. Speaker Harvey, what do you think of, uh, you talked about Iran as being part of the Saxon people, the uh, reports of Iran has basically infiltrating the Biden administration. Do you see that as playing a role? I see an overwhelming intelligence failure. But understand what transpired from one administration to the next. From the very first day of the Biden administration, they moved towards appeasement. 
Iran, economically, their regime was in trouble. Four billion dollars in reserves, 70 billion today. 400,000 barrels being produced to three million today. Look at the price of oil as well, as, he, as this Biden administration attacks our own ability to produce. But watch what else happened. The shift to now start paying ransom for Americans, so more were captured. The six billion, but it wasn't just the six billion, it's the production of oil as well. It's every movement they have taken. And what does it mean when you move towards Iran? Our allies wondered whether we'd be there. Then look at the next decision, what he did in Afghanistan. It made our closest of allies move to China. It allowed China to enter the Middle East to bring Saudi Arabia and Iran together. He criticizes Saudi Arabia but praises Iran. Then he moves our intelligence to the number one priority being climate change. However important we understand climate change to be, it's not the number one issue of the intelligence community. This is a colossal failure. And then to open up our borders, knowingly what's coming across, to allow a secretary to tell you the border is secure when nobody can ever look at you in the straight face and believe that. You have 151 people on the terrorist watch list that were arrested. Do you know how difficult it is to get on that list from the FBI? But in 2019, the number was zero. Iran is stronger, more financially secure, and utilizing that resources to fund terrorism around the world. Killing Americans, taking hostages of Americans. Put it in perspective. Nine Americans died so far that we know. 800 Israeli deaths of a population of 9 million. If that was to happen on American soil, based upon what's coming across this southern border, that's the equivalent of 30,000 Americans being murdered and slaughtered. So what we should be doing and what he should be doing right now, President Biden, is securing the support of every other nation around the world for Israel to defend themselves. This will not be a short endeavor. Just as ISIS was our number one priority to remove, Hamas should be as well and any terrorist organization associated with Iran. Three billion dollars to spend what? To, to, to spend now three billion, isn't that true? What, in what, in what, what are you talking about? What department? You, you have a number of uh, areas to spend. It, are you talking about $3 billion to spend on the border, $3 billion to spend in weapons, $3 billion to spend where? Are you talking about aid to Ukraine? That's not true. You have $9 billion. Right now in Israel, we store ammunition. We should be able to release that. Um, another thing that needs to happen here, as we had supplied arms to Ukraine, we have depleted our stockpile. We are slow in redeveloping our stockpile. This is something I have asked this administration time and again. I believe it could be a bipartisan, that we should expand our ability for a production so we are never caught short. And we watch this terror. And the one thing you have to realize, this new evil axis of power work together. But how can our own intel department not realize what the Wall Street Journal knows of meetings in Beirut, of planning, of even on the internet, of saying 45 days ahead? This was the 50th anniversary. As this took place, I have many friends in Israel, in government and out. I called the speaker, Ohana. We're close. I thought, to me, it felt as though a lot like 9-11 in my life. He said, no, it was more like Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor came on a day that most Americans were going to go to church.
It was a surprise attack. It was an intel failure, similar to what happened here. I called other friends who I've known quite some time that I visit in Israel and they visit here. He has three daughters. One was already called up in service. They said, please tell Americans that this won't be over in a short endeavor. That this is something they have never seen. The amount of deaths that was slaughtered like the Holocaust. Taking of their phones so they can film it and show others. Parading children and grandparents. Holocaust survivors. Who are we? Who are they? Why can we have somebody that's elected to Congress defend that? And why are people so afraid to condemn what they said? That's wrong. Yes. I was asking her. <laughs> Go ahead. I let the, I let the um, conference see who, the, who, who unites them. Speaker, yes, ma'am. Speaker, there have been some members advocating that you do return to the leadership, especially in light of the situation in Israel right now. If nominated in conference this week, would you accept that? Look, conference can decide all that. Speaker, you mentioned you have friends in Israel. You've traveled there many times. What message does this send to our allies, the rest of the world, that the House is not elected a new speaker? It's wrong. It's wrong. The whole action. I think the base is why it took place. Because I made a decision to keep government open. What if government wasn't open? How weak would we be then? You know, people get to run for office. People get to perform as they want. Sometimes people perform for their own personal but there comes a moment in time that people should stand up to that. This is the United States of America. We are living in very dangerous times. The pettiness has got to stop. And if, if Democrats pick it simply because it's politics and think they have a better chance of winning a majority, that's wrong too. Look, they, they had been planning it for quite some time. I, I think a number of things have transpired. I think a new administration that goes to appeasement, that didn't embrace Abraham Accords, that actually went after our allies like Saudi Arabia and rewarded those who were evil like Iran. That right there gives you challenges. Secondly, the president's decision when it came to Afghanistan. People then question, would America be there? We watched the culmination of this new axis of power, of evil, of China, Russia, and Iran. We watched the president when he met with Putin that literally lifted the sanctions off Nord Stream 2 but got nothing in return. It was a Neville Chamberlain moment. We watched his attack on American energy production, lowering the SPRO, our strategic petroleum reserve, is down to nothing. The price of oil is up higher. It's almost $100 a barrel. The production in America attacking it. Those are moments in time that are weakness. That is when evil feels they can move. And that's exactly what they did. I don't think it's just the Iron Dome that needs to be replenished. We, we want to make sure that we kill Hamas, destroy Hamas. The technology that America has is superior to all. Israel is a tremendous fighting force. But the more precision-guided missiles, the more tactics that we can supply them with ammunition, that American forces, Israel has never asked an American soldier to fight for them. They've done it on their own. But we can support the ammunition to make sure they can get the job done. 
Because the one thing that we learn, I would leave it to the military experts to come back and assess what they currently need to get the job done. And I would be there to support it. But the first thing I would do, I would support now. So there would be no question and no doubt in the world that no one else enters this conflict. And I want to make it very clear that this will not be Afghanistan, that we will not leave Americans on the ground. This administration has to learn. We do not do that as America. Yes, ma'am. Right now, Ukraine still has another nine billion that they can draw down sitting there um, for arms. The question comes now in our stockpiles. We need a whole new ability for the procurement and movement of the building of our weapons. It's too slow. It takes too long. And we've watched others try to take advantage of it. We need to create the Silicon Valley of the production. Something I've been trying to work with this administration for quite some time. I've had many conversations across the aisle. I will tell you the leader on the other side of the aisle believes it as well. Yes, sir. Uh, if, as you say, the House cannot do anything at this moment, so there's no, no way around that, uh, do you feel that what's happening in Israel has added urgency to hold your conference to try to button up the speaker's race sometime? Well, well, let's be honest about our conference, all right? Is our conference just going to select somebody to try to throw them out in another 35 days if, if, if eight people don't get 100% of what they want and 96% of the conference does? Is these eight people upset because in a debt ceiling we got the greatest reduction in spending in American history? We got work requirements. We got reform to NEPA where we could build things in America, and two-thirds of the conference voted for it? Or they got more than the majority vote for to keep government open. Would they weather as they sat on the floor and said we should have shut the government down, that these same people led the charge to stop us from passing any appropriation bills, to even shutting Congress all down for an entire week of any bill they want because they didn't get what they want, and then not even to pass a continuing resolution that would secure our borders and cut government, and then blame me because they worked with every single Democrat because we kept government open? It's not just electing somebody that's new. It's whether you want to be a conservative who will govern. That's the question the conference has to realize. And for the idea that you allow eight people to continue to do that with no consequences, no one's going to be successful. Yes, ma'am. That's not my decision. That's the conference. The one thing I will tell you, um, there are a number of people that understand the importance of Israel. Just last week, even before the attack that we saw on Saturday, President Israel Herzog called me, just based upon what was transpiring here, just as a friend. I understand, and I hope all of America understands, when Israel became a nation, the first country to recognize it within 11 minutes was America. It was an honor for me to be only the second speaker in American history to speak at their Knesset, their Congress, in honor of the 75th anniversary. They have different parties there, too, but to watch all of them stand. I did not go alone. I took a big bipartisan group of members, because I know that's where we stand. But when I watch and hear and read what some inside Congress, anti-Semitic comments, that really disturbs me. Yes? Where has kind of gone into your, uh, just a little bit of a change in mindset where you're now saying that you're open to being considered Look, I, Is the tax plan to that or is there something else? No, I, I, I think the basis here, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying. You asked me a question. I simply said, the conference decides that. I don't decide that. The conference has to come to an understanding. If this conference, regardless of who's going to be speaker, if it allows a few individuals that love a camera more than they love the American public, we're not going to govern. If you want individuals to stop any movement, then blame the speaker because something didn't happen, we're not going to be productive. I'm a conservative that believes in governing in a conservative way. 
I can only think if government was shut down right now, what would we be talking about? What would our men and women even be questioning? What would the border look like? Would people around the world, would Iran take advantage of that? They might be taking advantage of the border right now. Yes, sir. Look, it, it, we're a new territory. It was developed because after 9-11, questioning what if the speaker wasn't there. I, I think at a moment in time, our conference needs to decide who should lead. If not, we shouldn't sit back. So. Well, to put a really fine point on that, um, the congressman is discussing the resolution supporting Israel to the It wouldn't, ma it wouldn't matter what I supported because just as you watched when I had to go 15 rounds, you cannot do anything without electing a speaker. So that means have, you, have you seen, uh, you mentioned Kim Jeffries basically silence about what she did a lot That's not leadership. That's not leadership at all. Have you seen anything from any more rank and file Democrats who I, 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 I have watched some Democrats stand up to them. That's one thing. But think about what we're talking about. Think about the world in which we're living. Think about their anti-Semitism and the history of it, of what they have done. And think about the Americans that were just killed. Think about the 800 that were just killed. The greatest slaughter we have watched against the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And to say no comment? I don't understand that. I do not understand that. I want to follow up on an earlier question about Ukraine and Israel. Um, the Prosecutor General in, in Ukraine says there have been 100,000 war crimes. Uh, the Russians have been accused of using rape as a, as a military weapon on the battlefield. Uh, and yet a week ago, uh, your conference, um, including your decision, was to excise funding uh, for Ukraine from the CR. Um, if the standard is that the U.S. is against terror and against uh, atrocities happening uh, in countries, Territories. Um, how does that square with Republicans seeking one hold Ukraine hostage for border security purposes? Easily, because nothing was going to change with Ukraine because there's nine billion dollars. There's nine billion dollars the administration can draw down. So there's no change in that. But also, I'm concerned about our southern border. 151 people on the FBI terrorist watch list has been arrested this year. In 2019, the number was zero. How many have we missed? We watch what just transpired in Israel when they have a wall, but not one, but two, with a road in between and sensors on it. We've watched Iran become more powerful, stronger financially, and using it to fund terrorism further around the world. I saw what the world was three years ago, and I know what the world is today. And it's much more dangerous. No, I did not fear because you had 45 days to not only deal with that, but also deal with America. I've been very clear with this administration. The open border has got to stop in America. That's not just my opinion. Take Democratic leaders. The governor of Massachusetts, if they were to come to Congress, they couldn't meet with one Republican member in their delegation because they don't have one. They only have Democrats. But in Massachusetts, the state of emergency isn't because of a flood. It's because of the southern border and immigration. In New York, we just had the mayor of New York City travel not only to the southern border, but out through, out th through Latin America. Not for trade, but to stop the southern border and the Biden administration. We have a president that refuses to talk to the American public about this. We have a Democrat leadership that won't stand up to anti-Semitism. That's not who we are. We are better than this. And this is a moment in time that those who are elected to Congress should look at one another and understand history will look back at this moment. Take your politics aside, take your pettiness aside, take your own personal ambition aside, and put what is best for this nation 
in a time of crisis and what's best for our allies and freedom around the world. Thank you all very much.